All right, this morning I invite you to turn in your Bible to the book of 1 John. And we're going to be in chapter 3, verse 4 to 10. Also, if you have your scripture journal that we have provided for you, uh, if you have one of those still kicking around, you can pull that out or on your device as well. It'll also be on the screen. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 to 10. And if you've been following along a little bit, I know some of you kind of like, okay, hit or miss. You've been away, you come back, away, you come back, and you're like, okay, where, where are we at in this First John series? We've, uh, we've dipped back and forth a little bit. And so last week, Carson was already in chapter 4, and today I'm kind of going back to chapter 3, but just the way that things sort of worked out and some key things that we didn't want to miss uh, in the process. And so First John 3, verse 4 to 10 today. And it says this, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Verse 10, by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you today for your word. Lord, it challenges us. Sometimes it's hard uh, to understand. Sometimes, Lord, we are stubborn in our will. Sometimes we, all in all, just do not want to listen. And so today, Lord, we pray that you would open up our ears. Peel off the layers of our, of our heart that have grown hard. Allow us to hear you. Let your spirit do your work, Lord, in us. So that we could be able to see you and hear you more clearly from your beautiful word. Amen. You know, it's no mystery that music is a powerful thing. If I were to ask you some of your most significant memories, chances are there is a song attached to it. Maybe if you were like me and you, you played a sport in high school or like, you know, volleyball, there was like a warm-up song. Um, I well, you know what? I had my moment, right, talking about Def Leppard a while ago. I should probably move on from that. But you know how it was, 80s, right? 80s music, is there a better era of music? I don't know. Uh, but anyways, uh, maybe, you know, like you, I mean, high school, you, you cruised the, the strip on Main Street in Herbert, Saskatchewan. Uh, no? Okay. Uh, it, was, it was Bon Jovi back then. Uh, maybe your grad theme song. You can remember what you walked in on, you know, walked in with. And for me, it was the, the Top Gun anthem, right? It was an awesome song. Near, 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 near. See? I should have I had Lane come up here and just, uh, just play it before. That would have been perfect. But those memories, it takes you right back, right? Or maybe your, your wedding song or the song that you walked in or you walked out of your wedding to. Interestingly enough, a wedding we were at a couple weeks ago, they walked out, or the groomsmen actually walked into the Top Gun anthem. <laughs> so, you know, it's still around, it's still kicking. Uh, but, you know, music is powerful, right? It, it connects to our hearts. It connects to our memories. At, at camp, we teach scripture memory verses to kids in songs, right? That's how they, we, we teach them. More than memories, more than just emotional connection, I want to ask you a question today. What if your life was a song? What if your life was a song? More than just a theme song, but actually, what if it was 
a song. So for illustration purposes only, as you won't see that directly in the text, I want to use the idea of music or a song as a way to, to connect the dots with what John is saying in this passage that we just read. And so we're going to walk through three points. First of all, sin is singing our own song. Secondly, Jesus is the new song. And third, <clears throat> we don't keep singing the old song. All right. Now, first of all, the context of this text comes out of what we talked about a few weeks ago. If you were here in our, <clears throat> in our backyard, uh, back 40 there on our, on our uh, long weekend service, and we, we talked about this really briefly before, <clears throat> before we went into our, our communion time, but from 1 John 3, verse 1 to 3, and this is the foundation for how God has interacted with us as his creation from the beginning. Now, John talks about things often as he says, this is what you heard from the beginning. And what he's talking about is not from the beginning of all time, the beginning of creation. He's saying to his audience, this is what you have heard from the beginning when you first heard the gospel. When you first responded to Jesus this is what you heard, this is what you were taught, and that was your beginning. What I'm saying here is that from the very beginning, from creation, this is the song of God, the song of love. He created us out of love, and he invites us to be his love children, as this initial passage right before this one says. He invites us as his children, to come, to be under his care as the Father. And so as we receive that love, it then motivates us to live lives of, of purity. It really is the Father's love song over us. Zephaniah 3 verse 17 says, The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. He will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. You know, there's a lot of passages in the Bible that speak of his power and his salvation, but God, the Father, actually singing over his children. What kind of song would it be? But just a guess, but I, I think it would be a love song, and in my mind, it's an 80s rock ballad. I was kind of disappointed, Lane, that you weren't wearing like your, your Demon Hunter shirt this morning. I mean, come on, but this, the word that is used here to describe how the Father sings over us as his children, it means a ringing cry, it's a loud shout, it's a proclamation of extreme joy and an expression of gladness. You know, it's, it's been a while since I've used an illustration of my granddaughter, Macy, but lately we've been getting these videos of, of her, you know, trying, you know, standing up on her own, right, in her, in, her, in her crib, her playpen. She grabs onto things and she pulls herself up and she's got these fat little legs wobbling, you know, she stands up. And as our, our daughter, Bria, is, is videoing her, you know, she's cheering her on. You know, she's exclaiming it like she's so passionate. But she's way to go, Macy, you're doing amazing. You're so great. That's awesome. And, and there's these little pictures we have of Macy. I could probably talk the whole time about Macy, but I won't. But she kind of looks and she gets these pictures and it's kind of like, look at me, look at me, like look what I've done. You know, all proud of herself. She's standing up, she's crawling upstairs and her daughter and her son-in-law behind her are just like cheering her on. Just this, this exclamation of joy. And this is this picture of the father just singing over us and exclaiming with gladness how much he loves us. So if we take the idea that God is, is singing over us. Let's allow that to, to be the foundation as we dive into verse 4 to 6 initially. First of all, sin. What is sin? Sin is singing our own song. Verse 4 says, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. So sin is basically saying you are a law unto yourself. You do whatever you want. Since the fall that we read of in Genesis 3, we have a sin nature. It's our natural 
self. And our natural self always leads us to wilderness, never to fruitfulness. It's the tune that we live by, seeking to please ourselves rather than to obey God. This is a familiar tune. It's what we know. It's a melody that is like one of those songs that you hear and, you know, you just can't get it out of your head. This is what sin does. It, it elevates and promotes self while disregarding the instruction of God. Now, every time you set something other than God on the throne of your life, including yourself, it leads to ruin. The Bible also says that sin has a penalty, and either you pay it or someone else had to. And we know the beautiful gospel is that Jesus came and did that for us. See, if our sin was inconsequential, didn't matter, then Jesus would not have had to die for it. Now, the daily cost of, of humming this tune in our lives is, is great. There's a great cost on all fronts, physical, emotional, relational, and on and on. But the Bible says that the ultimate results of singing this song, this sin song, are costly. Romans 6 verse 23 says that the wages of sin is death. That's the, that's the return. That's what you get for it is death. And this is speaking of eternal spiritual death. As opposed to what the Apostle Paul goes on to say, there, there's another option. And it's good news. And that is to receive the gift of God that is eternal life found in Jesus. Romans 3 21 to 26 says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. And so we see that we fall short but that God came in and, and always the rescuer sent his son Jesus to be our justice and the one who justifies. And so secondly, we see that Jesus is the new song. He's the new song. Verse 5 says, you know that he appeared, he, Jesus, appeared in order to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. Jesus, the sinless one. The one John the Baptist recognized when he saw him, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He came, away, came to take away sin, and verse 7 says that he came to destroy the works of the devil. What's the work of the devil? Well, it's sin. That's what his work is. I don't... No, if he gets up every day and says, well, I'm going to get my work clothes on, but in your mind, you could think this way. That's what he does, his work, every day. Well, let's get out there and get rebellious. Let's get out there and accuse people. Let's get out there and tear down the works of God. Let's get out there and confuse, manipulate, steal, kill, and destroy. And John says that the work of Jesus is, is to take care of that, to destroy the work of the devil. See, he's been up to this from the very beginning. And he's been singing this enticing temptation song from the very first time we see him in Scripture with Adam and Eve. Now, when you think of the devil's song, you might think, oh, it must be like thrash metal or something like that. But you know what? It's more like a sultry lullaby. Gently whispering in our ear. Cajoling us 
to God rebellion. But God sent a Savior, Jesus. And his name means the Lord saves. His mission is to provide a means of salvation. And for centuries, people of Israel looked forward to the promise of a Savior. They had moments of confusion. They didn't always get what that meant. But God's word and through the prophets and through the poets told us that there would be a new song to be sung. And the work of Jesus on the cross and by his resurrection meant that there would be a way to be forgiven and to hear the God song clearly. An invitation to new life. Psalm 40 verse 3 says, He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Psalm 96, verse 1 and 2 says, Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord. Bless his name. If today, if you have, by faith, received Jesus Christ and have begun to abide with him, you've received his Holy Spirit. And listen, the entire song sheet of your life has changed. 2 Corinthians 5 or 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, and the new is here. And finally, third, we don't keep singing our old song. Verse 6 says, No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Now, really important. As you read this, you go, oh, man, that's, that's a pretty high standard. John is, is not saying that once you receive Jesus, that you stop sinning and you enter into this, this perfected state. I, I don't know about you, but, I, I mean, it would be great if that was the case, um, but it's not. And John already has confirmed this earlier in his book. He said in chapter 1, he says it's actually a deception to believe that you do not sin. And as he said in verse, chapter 1, verse 9, that when we do sin, we confess our sins. And he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He goes on to say in chapter 2, right at the beginning, he says, I write to you so that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So what John is talking about here is not a, a perfect life. It's a life that's characterized by the ongoing, self-endorsing habit of sin. Let me hear that again. He's talking about a life that is characterized by an ongoing, self-endorsing habit of sin. See, if you truly surrender to Christ, your life song is being transformed. There's the ongoing work of sanctification. You're becoming like Jesus. And this honestly is a work of learning to sing the God song. What was old was familiar and you can easily fall back into it. But you know, it's going to require some change. I liked what Carson said last week. He said, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not that we don't try, right? It's not that, that there isn't actually putting effort in. The gospel is not opposed to effort, but earning. We don't do it so that we would earn it. But we have to put some effort in. And coming to Christ, there, there might mean, there will mean some changes that could happen, need to happen in your life. Conscious, active steps of obedience. It could mean very easily a change of friendships. People you hang out with. Could mean a change in, in what you do for fun, recreation activities. Could mean a change in your priorities. It will. It might even mean a change in vocation. If you've surrendered your life to God, and now you're singing a new song, there's going to have to be some transformation that is evident in your life. N.T. Wright says this, what John is talking about here is the whole habit of life, sinning as the regular mode in which we live. 
We should be doing our best to avoid all kinds of sin all the time, though we shall surely fail. But listen, this is important. But the failures must take place within the settled, a settled habit of life in which sin is no longer setting the tone. We're playing a different piece of music now, and even if our fingers slip sometimes and lay some wrong, play some wrong notes, notes that belong to the music we used to play, that doesn't mean we're going back to that old music for real once more. John actually says something quite wild here. He says that believers have the seed of God within them. Quite literally, this, this word, the Greek word for seed, is it's sperma. And we're not going to go into a biological lesson here of things. But, you know, just like you carry the DNA of your biological parents, and you really can't help the nose that you have or the color of your eyes, He's saying, as a child of God, you've been reborn with the very spiritual DNA of God. And so sin is your old life song. And you're given a new one, reborn in Christ. You know, the question of this series that we've said from the beginning, am I in the light? And this, this text serves as a, a dire warning, really. If your life is characterized by the ongoing, self-endorsing, habitual life of sin, John would say you should question whether you have truly surrendered to the new life found in Jesus. John says the fruit of this new song is a life of righteousness and a life of love. Those are the two metrics. And so if your life is not reflective of these two clear metrics, it would seem that you are singing not only your own sin song, but you're dancing to the devil's song. He says there's only two kinds of children. Children of the light, children of God, and children of the devil. Ephesians 5 verse 1 to 10 says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. And walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality. Or any kind of impurity or greed. Because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place. But rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. So this morning I leave you with a simple question. What song is your life singing? Let's pray. God, in this world that we live in that is so set up in opposition to God, where there is temptations on every side and opportunities abound for us to walk in disobedience to you. Lord, you've, you've changed the music for us. So we've called out to you and we've said, Lord, we need your salvation. We need your forgiveness. We need your power to enable us to fight sin, to fight the evil in this world. And you've given that to us, and you've made it possible through Jesus. And now, Lord, as we seek to walk out this new song, we need your strength and we need your power every day. And so I pray, Lord, that you'd fill us anew with your spirit today. Refresh our, our hearts if we feel like we're, we're kind of down. If there is sin that has taken a hold in our life, if there's cracks in us, Lord, in our spiritual lives that are, 
are taking control or we feel like we are losing ground, Lord, would you remind us again the power of the cross, what you have done for us. And Lord, the, the song of our hearts, may it be that we want to worship you and live for you. Amen.